Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Everybody and welcome to another episode of Turn the Page, the official podcast of Syosset Public Library. I'm Jen, your host today, and I'm here with the author of a really funny and touching and thought-provoking new YA book. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Hi, everyone. My name is Jada Dia, and I'm the author of There Goes the Neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm so excited to talk about this book. But before we dig into it, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, just your background and how it led you to this book, because I saw on your website that you've studied a whole bunch of really interesting things uh, during your uh you know, uh, undergrad and postgrad career. So I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how those subjects maybe led you to this book. Oh, yeah, sure. So yeah, I mean, the the kind of funny thing about how this book came together for me is I definitely did not grow up thinking I wanted to be an author or that I wanted to write books. Like, in fact, until literally the day that I opened a Word doc and decided to start writing for the first time, I had never considered writing a book before. But I had, you know, like you said, I was kind of in a lot of spaces thinking about a lot of the themes that are important there goes the neighborhood. So as an undergrad, I was in this amazing program called Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. So I was really deep in the ethnic studies space, which was important to help me develop, I guess, like a vocabulary around all of these topics about intersectionality and, you know, um, all of that sort of stuff. And then I ended up from there uh, working in schools. I, I'm born and raised in LA and uh after college, I was working in some schools in South Central, and that was a really interesting experience there, too, because I was, you know, back in, like, the city where I grew up, working in a school environment, working in a school that had a lot of challenges, a lot of really great people working there, but, um, you know, the type of, like, systemic issues that you always hear about with a lot of schools, unfortunately, when it comes to, like, underfunding and like over policing of students and stuff. So that was kind of what got me thinking about this idea of, you know, how smart and creative like young kids are, where they're able to be in these environments where they have a lot of labels put on them and people are telling them how they should be and how they should react. But my students were funny as hell and they're like roasting me all the time and they were just, you know, able to really like roll with everything. And then that led me to law school, which was a very weird choice for me. But um, another thing that I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to do, but there I was studying critical race theory. And that was helpful for me to, you know, build a vocabulary around these issues from like housing policy and housing injustice to thinking about, um, you know, just the way that like black people and black families are treated by like local governments and different incentives that there are to kind of separate our communities. So a long <laughs> convoluted answer to say that I was in a lot of different academic spaces thinking about these different things. And it wasn't until I was super bummed out in law school and having a very bad time where I decided I wanted to have a a creative outlet to explore these things I had been academically, you know, wrestling with for a while. That's so cool and interesting. And, you know, I'm really um, fascinated by um, how it illustrates to me um, because I came from academia before I came into libraries too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so many people think of these topics like, um, you know, intersectionality or critical race theory or even any like sort of theory driven study as being very like, um, you know, ivory towerish and separated from like your everyday mm -hmm. life and stuff like that. But this book to me really speaks to how all these like concepts and stuff can be communicated to like a very broad audience who doesn't necessarily have that training, you know, and shown that it has like, yeah, everyday impacts on people's lives. 
Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And that's really what I had in mind when I was trying to write it, because, you know, exactly what you said, there's a perception about all of these things being, you know, hard to talk about, or like they have to be dissected in like this very specific way. But I think like, you know, Jenna, I don't know how you felt. But I just got very tired of that type of language and like that, how how stuffy academic environments can feel. But, you know, what you know, they're still really important and everything. But I do think that that's kind of why I'm happy that I started ethnic studies, because that whole foundation is like, it's the study of power and how it's articulated across like race, class, gender, sexuality and stuff. So, you know, just having that background to think of this as like, there are people that will try to keep these conversations in academic spaces, but those people aren't necessarily our co-conspirators for the movement. Like at the end of the day, people on the ground, they know what's happening best. They are like viscerally experiencing, you know, all these things we're talking about. So that's kind of the fun thing about art is that you could bring it to a space that's really putting people first. And I hope that with this book that comes across that it's really trying to be a very um, like the human impact of gentrification and like all that comes with it, like the funny, the absurd stuff. And, and yeah, it's supposed to be kind of the anti, <laughs> an anti-academic approach to it in terms of just a very grassroots tone for the book. Yeah, I, I think it is done so well here, you know, and I think that the choice to, um, make it a YA story with like YA age protagonists is like really powerful because, you know, most of the reading that I've done about gentrification has happened in like, yes, like academic and activist spaces. And like, those are adults <laughs> for the most part, you know? Yeah. And it, it was really great to see like a, 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 a another view of it, you know, how it impacts kids and on the everyday level, you know? Um, yeah, so can you talk about the decision to, um, you know, pick, the protagonist that you did and to set it with the perspective that it has? Yeah, um, I guess, you know, for me, I, I started to think about writing YA because I, I started writing this book during the summer of 2020 that like iconically horrible and emotional chaotic summer where I think everyone was just going through it. Everyone was feeling it, figuring out how to digest it in, in different ways. And, you know, me and a lot of my friends, we were going to a lot of like protests and events around Los Angeles. And it was really interesting because, you know, at so many events, there were these like incredible, you know, high school age youth leaders who were doing so much cool stuff. And it was really interesting because, you know, like I, I like to still think of myself as young as well, but like, you know, I'm definitely not like Gen Z or anything. So it was really interesting seeing teenagers and just how different even their activism was from you know what my generation as like a younger millennial saw where they were bringing speakers to protest there were people doing like comedy sets or people dancing and it was like I that really stuck with me during that time to see like how creative and like hilarious a lot of these like new generation of activists and just kids who are just getting into this for the first time like they're approach really struck me as something really different. So that was kind of in the back of my mind when I knew I wanted to write a book about gentrification. And then the more that I, I guess, was in these spaces around these really cool young people that were like so much cooler than me, <laughs> I think that made me think like, okay, yes, it want, I want to be YA and I want it to lead with comedy and enjoy and really kind of celebrate like the the irreverence and the absurdity that I think Gen Z really brings to a lot of spaces. Mm. I yeah I totally agree with that that is so insightful and you know like I think it ties into another point that I've seen uh, that you've mentioned in um, interviews and on your website that a lot of your work is about uh, joy and Black joy, you know, because I think um, that's so important here, too, because the book deals with very serious issues that really, um, you know, impact the lives of the the characters in very real challenging ways. But it's also about like, yeah, joy and absurdity and like that perspective that we get from the younger generations, I think is so 
valuable, you know, like it's very, it's both humbling and uh, like exciting, like igniting, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, um, yeah, it's always, it's always just really exciting to see, you know, how every generation, like young people do something really different. And, you know, I think even just thinking back to how like me and my friends grew up, like I knew that, you know, I, even like when I was reading why when like I was a YA reader I remembered sometimes having a disconnect from a lot of the stuff that I was reading about at that time that you know had black protagonists because there were a lot of really incredible books that really meant a lot to me but like in that era so many of them were you know placed in like slavery or placed like in the civil rights movement or something like that you know they were it was a lot of historical fiction that was really popular at that time Um, And all of those works were super important. But like, I remember as a kid, you know, being like a super nerdy, like a weird kid with all these like goofy friends where we were just like walking around our neighborhood all the time. And like, you know, just like sneaking to movies and just like, you know, we were thinking about all of these big topics about like how racism affects us. And we were like living through it. But like, first and foremost, we were just kind of goofing around and like, like the kids in my book, like my childhood really was like so much of just bopping between people's houses and like hanging out in my neighborhood and like talking to my neighbors, going to cookouts, seeing people's lawns, you know. So it's it felt very natural to kind of try to capture that. And I think that there's a lot of really like amazing Black YA these days that's showing that, like leading with like the joy and leading like, you know, we all have complicated lives, we all deal with things, but like first and foremost, like, if you're, like, a weird, goofy kid, like, you know, that's kind of, like, how you're going to see the world for the most part, so, so I'm happy that came across. (laughs) It, yeah, really does, and, you know, I feel like the book really, I think, um, how do I phrase this, like honors the perspective of its young protagonists, you know, like it doesn't condescend to them, like it takes their views and their perspectives really, like seriously, even as it is like, you know, a very joyous book at at, at times. Um, Could you talk a little bit about like the main characters? Because I loved them all so much and just like the the group of friends that they hang out with. And, you know, they're so important too, because a really important theme in the book is found family. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how you kind of got uh, your ensemble together? <laughs> oh, oh, that's such a fun question. Um, I, let's see, how do they all come together? I mean, I guess I, I knew that I wanted to have the story told through the eyes of, well, one I thought was important to start with like 15 year olds, just because I think that that's an age that often gets kind of overlooked in YA, like so much of it's usually 16 to 18 year olds or there's a lot of really amazing like freshman way but I feel like recently and it hasn't always been the case but it at the time that I was writing it at least I had felt like oh it's been a while since I felt like that weird 15 year old ages because like that summer before you start your sophomore year is so confusing because you like just like you're done with middle school you did one year of high school but it sucked and you also have like so much high school ahead of you still so I know that, you know, I kind of wanted to start there. And I think there's still a lot of um, like playfulness and innocence at that age still. Um, So, yeah, I think for the story to work, for it to be, yeah, a story about kids who think of like a crazy idea to like save their friend group, they have to be naive enough to think that they can pull it off and also like good intention enough to realize like, you know, it's, you know, it's really a story about like the power of friendship and all that stuff. So, so I knew that that's the age I wanted to set it at. And yeah, I, I thought kind of going back to what I said earlier for, for me, I remember being like a young kid and wanting to see black kids, <clears throat> sorry, I wanted to see like black kids in black communities that were, um, yeah, like surrounded by other, um, I guess kind of like nerdy and like bizarre and kind of like kooky people, you know, because that's really how a lot of my friends were, where we were, um, had like a wide diversity where we had like athletes and people that were really like, you know, 
into like student council type stuff. But then, you know, we also had like a ton of friends that would get around and like play Catan together every weekend. And like we would have all these other things. And yeah, so I wanted to have like a young Black girl who has that critical edge and understands what's going on with her community, but um, get some like Black nerd rep in that we like don't get to see too often in the context of these stories that are like very political. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, like the friendships, I mean, uh, for the record, if any of my friends listen to this, no one's actually based off of anyone, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want to get in any trouble. <laughs> you I have do. no idea how often I hear that disclaimer. I like know. every every author's like this. No, please, friends, don't. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> especially I think especially for for people who write contemporary stories too where I'm always just like it's not anyone but I do think um I benefited from being and and still being in these you know friendships that started very young where um I still live in LA now and like my closest group of my best friends I've known them since I was two four eight and eleven <laughs> and like there's a group of ten of us where we really grew up together in the same neighborhood so it was easy for me to kind of think about those types of relationships like those best friends that you've had since elementary school that live down the street from you where you have that intimacy and you know South LA is an incredibly diverse place so between the characters I want to kind of showcase that because um, we don't get a lot of representation in YA books about like this part of Los Angeles in particular. So I wanted to show that, yeah, it's like a historically black and brown community. So it was important to me that there was going to be a Latinx character that was going to be front and center. I really wanted queerness to be front and center in that too, to show like, yeah, like even in these neighborhoods that don't get a lot of media rep, like there are still kids that are queer and questioning and like black and brown queer kids falling in love like that was important to include and yeah I I kind of just wanted to use the kids to kind of show the breadth of my own friend groups in terms of like race culture gender sexuality neurodivergence and kind of came into these three that felt cozy in the way that like my childhood friendships did Yeah, it really, it feels like lived in and it feels real. And I think it's, it it ties into what you said before about setting it at the age 15, I think, like that age is so resonant, I think, especially for the story, because as you were saying, like at 15, you're kind of feeling that pull between like wanting to stay a child and wanting to not wanting to grow up or wanting to be older than you are, you know, like you're kind of in the middle. (laughs) And that's kind of like what the situation these kids are in is doing to them too, you know, like they're being pulled into the real world in a really uh, like serious way. Um, Could you talk a little bit actually about, so like, what is it that the kids do to try to combat gentrification in their neighborhood? (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, okay. It's, it's a type of wild plan that when I was writing it, I was thinking, I was like, okay, what honestly, because the difference between how I grew up versus the kids in my book is my the neighborhoods that I grew up in weren't gentrifying that much at the time I was growing up. They are very much now, which is what made me think about placing this story somewhere close to home. But so that's kind of the difference. But when I was writing, I was trying to think, I was like, okay, but like if me and my friends were facing these issues to the extent that like kids these days in cities across America are facing in like a very real way now, like what would be our type of (laughs) solution to it? And so what the kids do is um, they're, at the start of the book, they're kind of quietly observing the ways that their neighborhood is changing and the ways that they're being perceived by people who are new to the neighborhood. You know, people who are crossing the street when they see them, you know, they're seeing this like increased surveillance of them and their neighbors and stuff. And so they're aware of these subtle social changes that are happening in the neighborhood. So the crazy plan that they hatch up, you know, is that they're looking at these people like who are predominantly white, who are gentrifying their neighborhood, but recognizing on some level, they're still kind of afraid of us. And they, you know, feel very able to gentrify this neighborhood because, you know, 
it's a perceived as like not as dangerous as other places. So the kids kind of decide to take that and decide, okay, well, like, let's see if we can scare them back out of the neighborhood. So they make of this crazy plan where they're like, hey, if they're going to be racist and they think that we're gangbangers anyway, like, let's get together and like, let's make them think that we really are. So they go online and they start a fake gang with hopes of getting a developer to pull out of the neighborhood, um, which is their wild way of kind of truly like accepting and or not accepting, but really understanding with a lot of nuance the the racism that's being thrown at them and also understanding the factors that need to be in place for gentrification to to happen, that there has to be this sort of conspiracy between the city and real estate agents and landlords to rebrand a neighborhood as like something that's cool and trendy and hip, but also like safe. So, so yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rambling at this point, but yeah, that's their, their crazy plan. They start a fake gang to scare the people out of the neighborhood who they suspect are already a little bit afraid of the longtime residents anyway. Hmm. It's, it's such a, 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 it's such a 15 year old plan, you know, like it is, so, <laughs> it's so perfect totally. for like, uh, their age group and, you know, for what they're trying to do. And, you know, while you were speaking, it reminded me that like, what I also read, I think in an interview or your website was that, you know, a lot of this is not just about like race and class, but also like capitalism. And, you know, that's what I was thinking of when you were talking about all these forces that have to really, um, conspire in order to make these things happen. So like these kids are also like, uh, you know, engaging in like a sort of anti-capitalist, uh, like, yeah. well, you know, and that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think so. Definitely. It's, um, yeah, it's such a 15 year old plan. Exactly what you said, because you have to be, you know, you have to understand what's happening in a real way and you have to see the consequences, you know, the book starts with one of the best friend's families facing eviction, so they understand that. But you also have to be just enough of a kid to think that maybe this could go well and, you know, have that understanding of like, ah, what's the worst that could happen, you know? And 15, 14 is kind of the perfect age to really think this through and be like, yeah, this could work. And it and it does until, until it doesn't, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like... Um you know, you, at that age, you are perceptive enough to like see and understand these things happening around you, but like, maybe not to like understand cause and effect or <laughs> like, <Exactly. laughs> unintended consequences yeah. for sure. Um, but I really just want to say that like, I, I love like the, um, you know, the way that these kids and their plan is uh, treated because it really allows like the kids to be kids. And that like, feels like a very important thing, like in a, a world or like in a country where like black kids are policed more than white kids and their behavior is really like analyzed and critiqued and you know discussed in a way that you know that white kids aren't aren't subject to like that you know uh examination so like i just really appreciate like the sort of like complexity and like the 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 vibrancy of these kids who are kind of just like allowed to be kids in this space you know thank you Thank you. That means a lot. And I'm, yeah, again, just happy that that came across. And what I hope that readers who do pick up the book will realize that, you know, there's, there's the hook and there's this pitch about the book being about gentrification, but like, you know, and that is what it's about, but at its core, it really is like a found family coming of age story with a lot of romance and first crushes. And like, really, I wanted to, you know, I would hope that readers feel that the kids and their experiences just being kids is what really leads and drives the story. And, you know, the political stuff is a part of it, but, but yeah, I, I hope that that's what comes across to people as well, that it's truly kids being kids, but kids being kids in a complicated, nuanced environment, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming here and talking about this book. Cause I really, I loved it so much, and I'm really excited for our, our listeners to read it too. Um, do you plan to write any more, sort of like in the YA space, or like what are your plans going forward? 
Yeah. Um, I would, so I do have another YA book coming out with Disney Hyperion in 2024. I have not thought of, it's written, but I have not thought of a title for it yet. <laughs> um, but it's another YA book that's going to be set in Los Angeles. And yeah, I, you know, ever since I've really started writing, I've, I felt um, that I'm very much doing the thing that is making me happy right now. So for the foreseeable future, like I, you know, hope that this is a space that I can stay in. I, I really love um, whether I stay in YA or go a little bit younger, or go a little bit older um, for my age groups that I write for. I think I still want to keep this theme of like accessibility of stories that like I I hope that this book feels this way and I hope that future projects are ones that you know it might be marketed as YA because I want kids to understand that they could read this too but there's stuff for adults to get from it as well like I I love especially when we're talking about these issues about like you know capitalism and systemic racism and urban policy and stuff I think accessibility is important to me in art so that everyone can be a part of the conversation so yeah whether it'll be why or not I I think thematically um this is going to be how I'm going to approach writing for a while oh well, great well I hope that you know you'll consider coming back and talking to us again about uh the second book because yeah this one just made me really excited about like you know all the things that you're going to write going forward so thank you again for coming to talk to us <laughs> you so much Jen I appreciate this so so much and yeah this is this was a real treat and I can't wait to yeah stay in touch and hear more about everything going on at the library just thank you for supporting this book truly you're so welcome and thank you um okay listeners so I highly suggest that you pick up There Goes the Neighborhood. Uh, as of the time that you hear this, it will be available at your favorite independent bookstore or library, wherever you like to get your books. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And it is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.